my dad always told me, 99% of being a parent is showing up for your kids. This from a man who deferred countless promotions to be sure that he came home for dinner every night and echoed by my mom who gave up her career to raise me and my sisters. In our family, we hug until the other person lets go and then just a little bit longer as a reminder that the best part of any relationship comes from that choice to show up, to stay. Today, we're experiencing the opposite, an epidemic of leaving. Social media is filled with white flags of people giving up, surrendering. Unfriend me if you don't support X. I don't want to be friends with anyone who believes Y. Decades-long relationships with colleagues and friends, even siblings, gone with a simple declaration. But what's possible when we stay? In those difficult conversations, relationships, with tension between ourselves and others. Every week, we hear stories of friends muting, blocking, unfriending each other on social media. And cancel culture? It makes it almost impossible to have relationships across difference. When your gut says to disavow a childhood friend, to leave behind a hometown, to cut and run, I want to challenge you today to ask, What's possible when we stay? Catholicism to me is an ethnicity. I was born into it. In my community, we used to trade gossip about priest Sunday sermons the way that some trade highlights about fantasy football leagues. And in my family, we prayed to saints for everything from world peace to help finding a parking space. The single monolithic experience of the Catholic Church touched everything and everyone in my life. So when at eight years old, I realized that I was gay, I hid that shame like a tattoo, a permanent reminder that I was different, that I didn't belong. In 28 years and two decades of Catholic education, I've experienced continuous intense opposition to my place in the Catholic Church. I've been called a faggot by my priest. I've been spat on leaving church multiple times. And in one stinging memory, had a teacher tell me to go to hell in front of her class of second graders. But I've also experienced the exact opposite reaction too. The very first time that I came out, I was in an Indiana Wendy's, sitting across from a priest who called my gayness a gift from God, my superpower. I still have friends and family who believe that I don't have a place in the church, but I do belong. LGBTQ people have always been a part of the church and always will be. I choose to stay in the church for the handful of people for whom my presence on Sundays will be the religious experience that they have that week. And when I walk into a church with my head held high, holding my boyfriend's hand, I get to be the change that I always wanted to see. And for a queer kid like me, wondering, hoping, even praying for some sign of belonging, that would have changed my world. Sometimes our decision to stay is less about our identity and more about how we choose to show up for friends. At the height of the 2014 war in Gaza, I worked as a summer counselor at a camp dedicated to conflict resolution between Palestinians and Israelis. Camp was founded on this extraordinarily simple idea that maintaining friendships across difference could make all the difference. Teens ate, slept, played sports together, chairs were thrown, yelling was frequent, but never did tears run more freely than when camp ended. Hugs between sides literally lasted minutes. Over the years, camp alumni communication channels, once so effusive and friendly, grew volatile with time and then silent. But under the surface, were incredible stories of lives changed, even saved, 
because friends made the decision to show up for each other. In May of 2019, when violence spiked again in Gaza, a Palestinian man placed a call to a commander in the Israeli Defense Forces with a single request, please protect my family. His former campmate replied, of course, my friend, they will be safe. What makes these moments so impactful is not just the decision to pick up the phone, to reach out. It's also on the other side about how we choose to answer the call. While working at NBC News, I often received a very different type of call. In our age of political polarization, death threats from angry viewers were frequent and some were spine-chillingly specific. I grew used to hanging up on hundreds of different calls with an instinctual click until one day, one unusual day, I heard something and decided to stay on the line. I remember the rage and the yelling even before the receiver hit my ear. But then I heard yelled a familiar town name? Travis was from Iowa, but not just Iowa, a tiny little town not 30 minutes from where my dad grew up and where I used to spend holidays with my grandma. And so while he was yelling, I built up some courage and I threw out, casually, I thought, you don't happen to know Happy Joe's Pizza, do you? Silence. And then he started laughing. In true Midwestern fashion, with zero explanation at all, we went from ranting about politics to raving about a local pizza joint that we both love. Another day, another caller, Melanie is from Kansas. We quickly learned on the phone that she loves profanity and she hates socialism. But this time I started asking her questions, trying to understand her anger. We discovered that she and my mom were both preschool teachers and that was a huge relief for her. <sighs> Thank God you get it. And truly I did. Last month, I had the surreal pleasure of wishing Melanie happy birthday on Facebook, where we're now friends. A very frequent caller used to call and ask for the gay one. Hi, John, I would say, answering the phone. John had recently moved to an assisted living home by his family. And once we got past his homophobia, he mostly wanted to just talk about college football with someone who would listen. This past fall, John's grandson came out, and surprisingly, he reached out to me, looking to understand how he could support. After our back and forth, I believe John will stay, if only for his family. I wish, standing here, that I could tell you with these examples that staying is easy. It's not. It's messy, it's unpredictable, and often it's not without great personal cost. And as such, it's easier to believe that our lives are better when we cut and run. But are they better? Or are they truly just easier? Too often I feel we make the easy choice. We see something and we're triggered, we get angry, we grab our phones and type, if you don't believe what I have to say, unfriend me, shut the hell up. Anger is easy. The alternative is what's harder. And maybe that's all it takes. One person who makes a different choice. I want you to imagine with me a different world where the choice to stay is our first instinct. Where we grow together instead of apart. Where we reach out instead of lash out. Where we make the decision to show up for other people with the understanding that by doing so, we increase the likelihood that they show up for us. Because isn't that what we all want at the end of the day? What is possible when we stay? The answer is everything. But you won't know unless you try. Thank you. Thank you.